our goal today is to talk a little bit about soft tissue management in the general dentistry practice. Now, uh, one of the reasons why I decided to invite uh, Dr. Brandan for this presentation was that uh, Dr. Brandan completed, before he became a periodontist, he completed an advanced education in general dentistry program at the University of Rochester. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that he graduated in 2012. I'll let him talk a little bit about that when he introduces himself. But after he did his training in the, in the AGD program at Eastman, he went and got trained in, in periodontics. So, uh, so now his practice, even though you know, he could most likely just do perio if he wanted to, he truly is a general dentist with a very strong periodontal background. And that's the way he practices. He does restorative dentist, dentistry and he combines his, his restorative dentistry with, with periodontics. So with that being said, uh, I think that it's a, it, it would be great for, for, for us to kind of see how does a, a, a combined perio uh, restorative practice uh, you know, is managed and, and what are the capabilities of, of understanding both sciences uh, allow you to kind of you know, do or perform different type of treatment options in your, in your practice. So with that being said, I'm just going to give it to, to Dr. Brandam and, uh, and I'll let him introduce himself and talk a little, about more, uh, a little bit more about himself and then go from there. If, you, if there's any uh, help that is needed with, with the English, I don't think that's going to happen, but if it does happen, I'll be more than happy to, 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 uh, to, um, to just get in and, and help you out. Okay, so I'm going to turn off my microphone and I'll leave you, I'll leave you with, with everybody else. Let me go ahead and admit one more person here. Okay. All right, go ahead, Luis. Okay, thank you, Mario. Well, first of all, thank you for everybody. My English is a little bit rusty. I haven't spoken English for eight years now. So let's give it a try. Well, today we're gonna to go talk a little bit about the soft tissue management in general practice. And nowadays we have to change a little bit this picture. We have to go, wait, what's gonna, what's happening? I can't pass the slides. Uh, yes, go ahead, go ahead and hit first. You have to start hitting the bar. Just hit the bar like a space bar. Yeah, nothing happens. Okay, go ahead and then how about the arrow? There you go. Oh, no. Okay. No. All right, there you go. Okay. Now the picture has to be like this with the mask because everybody's in, at home. Anybody can go out. We have the, the COVID-19. So this is how to... Well, I don't know why the picture is a little bit blurry, but anyways. Well, because we are going to talk a little bit about um, Perio, first topic we want to address is the, the static and sensitivity. Usually when the patient comes to see us, it's because of statics or sensitivity. We're not going to talk about the, the perio patient with the gum disease. We're going to talk about uh, recessions or more statics issues that the patient has. So the statics or sensitivity are the main issues when the patient comes to see us. And when the patient comes, we have to think in three topics, the, the evidence that we have, the, the, all the papers that we have, the point of view of the patient and the preference of the patient, and our um, expertise in dentistry. How can we address the, the patient's problem? The theology of recessions, usually the main theology is trauma. It's because of the brushing, the dental floss, uh, ortho, and sometimes the prosthesis and the occlusion can cause trauma to the gums. There's another etiology, but it's uh, less common, could be bacterial because of periodontal disease, viral, or just a mix because of the trauma and bacteria, because of the, the ortho, bacteria, um, plaque, lack of the plaque control of the patient can cause the recessions. And when we talk about recession, we have to go to the uh, Miller class. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how to say it. It's not in a very deep uh, perio presentation. That's why we are going to talk about the, the Miller class, and we're not going to talk about the, the Cairo class, uh, class, 
or the new classification, which is a little bit more uh, complicated. To understand very well, the class Miller is, we have four classes. Class one is when the recession don't go beyond the mucogingival junction. Class two is when it goes a little bit beyond the mucogingival junction, but it, in the interproximal tissues, we don't have any uh, lack of gum. <laughs> this is how we can see it here. Uh, this, I don't have the, the point. Well, class two has two classifications, but this is not important now. In the class three is when we lose a little bit of interproximal tissue and the, the recession is big enough to go beyond the mucogingival junction, or even if it doesn't go beyond, but we have lack of interproximal tissue. And the class four is when we have more interproximal uh, tissue loss than the recession. This is the most complicated um, recession that we're gonna treat. But now, why we have to look at them? Why we have to do surgery? And the main issue is because the 78% of the recession um, growth on the time. That's why when we see a recession, it's not gonna stop right there, it's gonna continue on time. And we have to give stability to the tissues. We have to change the gingival biotype to give stability. And that's with the um, tissue augmentation, the, the soft tissue grafts, we, we need to give the, the tissue the stability to, to keep on time. And then, because of this, the, the growth of the recession is related to the quantity of keratinized tissue that, they have, that the, the gum has. The other topic is because the, the root, when it's naked, when, when, it's, uh, when we have the recession, it's more susceptible to have cavities. And because of the root, it's more rough, it gets more plaque accumulation. So all these issues we have to address when we have the, the recession. Sometimes the general dentists, because they don't want to see this or they don't understand how to manage the gingival recession, they just put a uh, flow composite, they treat it like a class five, um, how do you say, like cavity. Yeah, class so, five cervical lesion. Class five cervical lesion, thank you. So, but it's, that's not true because the, the, the recession um, involves the enamel and involves the fruit of the tooth. So when we do a class five recession, we want to uh, treat only the enamel and the dentin of the patient, but not the root. The, the naked root, we have to treat it with a gum surgery because if we are gonna replace the, the lost tissue that the patient has, we have to replace it with the, the tissue that is lost. So if you lose a gum, we have to recover with gum, not with uh, too. That's why we have to think a little bit about this and, and understand how to treat them. Because if we understand that the 78% of the uh, recession growth on time, if we put it just a global composite, do a class five uh, lesion, it's gonna grow on time. So uh, on time we are gonna see some more plaque accumulation on the margin and the, the recession is gonna continue. So we have to treat it at the beginning when, when, the, when the lesion is, is small now. And before surgery, this is, uh, I put a little, a lot of toothbrushes in here because we have to give the patient a soft toothbrush and to change the, the technique of the brushing. Why to change the, the technique? It's not like the, the boss technique that everybody, um, learn at school, which is very good though, but it caused trauma. The brushing trauma, you can do a lot of uh, force on the tooth. And when you have a soft tissue, which is uh, a thin biotype, you can cause recession on time. That, that's why the, the brushing technique is one, one of the main issues of the, the recession. Sometimes we can see recession on the premolars or the canines when the patient do a lot of 
uh, strengthen those tooth with the brushing. They, they prefer to, to use, if, if you ask your patient, they might have a medium or hard um, brush. So they do a lot of force. If they brush with a softer uh, toothbrush, they don't feel they're, they're brushing. They, they feel the, like they're doing nothing to the tooth so that they prefer something uh, stronger. That's why we have to change that. We have to educate our patient to change the toothbrush to avoid more recession in their mouth. And now we are gonna go a little bit about how to treat the, the root. Uh, Mario, you said don't ask questions, but I don't mind if they have any question right now while we go through the process. If they wanna make any question, I don't have any problem. Okay, sure, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they'll be able to just turn on their microphone and they know how to use it. That's, I just didn't want, you know, whatever you decide is best, but I think that's great. If they have any questions, by all means, this is, you know, they can just turn their microphone and go ahead and ask. Yeah, because the, the presentation is quite long, so I, I'm going to address different topics if they want to go, for example, to implants or another topic, we can go, go there. There's no problem. So the preparation of the root, you see everything is in Spanish, but I'm going to translate it. There's no problem. We have to do the um, scaling and root planning to the root surface because when the root is uh, nude, it's the, the recession is in the mouth, that uh, root, that cement, it's contaminated with bacteria. So we have to, ch to remove all the contaminated cement and make a very, uh, how do you say, a plain surface. And when you see here, in the, the third picture, it doesn't go the, the curate to the bottom of the of the root because the, over there the root doesn't have any disease. It wasn't exposed to the, the oral cavity. So they have fibers attached and we don't want to touch those fibers. So if we touch those fibers, we're going to cause some sensitivity and we don't want that. So we just uh, root plant the, the, the part of the root exposed to the oral cavity. And before the surgery, when you can see here, there's no inflammation. We, we treat the patient before surgery. So tissue has to be really neat. And then there's uh, another kind of uh, preparation, which is chemical preparation. And over here, you can see very well the problem depth in the, in the first picture and the second, which is where the, the, um, the probe goes. So over there, we have to uh, root plan because it's the cement exposed to the oral cavity. But then there's another part in the third picture, which is the, the bone dehiscency, which is okay. There's fibers attached to that root. There's no exposure of that root to the oral cavity. So we don't have to treat it. It's every, everything over there, it's okay. It's, there's no bacteria, never has bacteria in, the, in that part. So we're gonna leave that without treatment. And the so let, me, let, me, let me interrupt you there so I can ask you a question. So that being said, so you go in and when you're, when you're treating a case like this, you go in with the probe, let's say that you measure yeah. five millimeters and the probe will touch the, the, uh, the epithelial attachment. So you stop there at five millimeters when yeah. you when you raise your flap in the middle photo there's a flap that's been raised you're going to go ahead and scale and root plane only the five millimeters where the actual pocket was where the epithelial attachment starts all the way down to the to the bony area there is no uh, uh in contamination of that root surface there is no uh, uh scaling and root planing of that area is that correct it's exactly right okay perfect because sometimes you have the hesitancies and you don't want to touch that because you're, you're just probing. It's not like um, a bone probing. If you do a bone probing, you can go all the way to the bone and you can probe the bone dehiscency, but you don't want to do, do this because you're just trying to cover the, um, the recession. You don't want to touch the, the root, which is okay, which it never had bacteria on it. 
Yep, understood. And then we have in that boot, we have the smear layer and we want to open the dental tubule. So we, we put EDTA for two minutes on the root surface. It's gonna give us better results and, and it's gonna improve the attachment of the new tissue to that area. So we have to put the, um, the EDTA for two minutes, then rinse it. And now we are gonna go ahead to close that recession. Well, now we are gonna go to see some cases. Here we can see the, the recession. We measure the recession. And now we are measuring the same um, depth of the recession to the interproximal area in both sides. That's gonna give us the idea how much tissue we want to gain when we put the flap in a new position. For example, if this, let's put this, if it's a three millimeter or four millimeter uh, recession, we are not gonna talk about now the, the problem depth. It's just the recession depth. It's a four millimeters. We have to measure from the tip of the papilla, four millimeters in both sides, mitral and distal. Because over there, we are gonna do our incisions, horizontal incision at the level of papilla. Then two vertical incisions, which goes one millimeter beyond the mucochinchival junction, which is gonna give us the mobility of the flap. We can move that flap forward to close the recession. And the last incision is just intracircular in that recession. So here is what we're gonna do. And you can see here, this is this kind of flap is just a split flap at the level of the papilla. This is gonna, we are gonna call it the surgical papilla because it's a papilla that we are gonna create. This is gonna be a split flap because we don't wanna touch the, um, how do you call it? Que quiere decir? Eh, ah, se me fue el nombre. El, la unión de, del hueso con el, el periódico. Con la el periódico. ¿Cómo, ¿cómo se dice? Periosteum. So we, are gonna, we don't want to touch the periosteum in this area, but at the level of the, of the recession, we have to do a full flap because, because of the tissue over there, it's very thin and we don't want to lose any tissue. We want to keep that tissue as it is. Then when we open just the papillas and the, the surgical papillas and the, the recession area with the full flap, we're going to have a very small flap that we're going to have to keep splinting to three millimeters, maybe to the um, mucogingival junction to give, uh, to have the flap uh, with the mobility. And after that, we are going to do a full flap at the end. That's going to give us the, the control to move the flap uh, coronally and we can close it. And because we cut um, this, this flap, we do the, the first horizontal incision at the same size of the recession. When we put the flap in the coronal position, we are gonna cover the whole recession. But because of because our split um, flap at the area of the surgical papilla, we can then do a depitalization of the anatomical papilla, the, the papilla that is already there. And when we put the, the connective tissue of the split flap with the connective tissue that we did because of the depitalization of the papilla, it's gonna um, bond and we can close that recession. So being said, first of all, we measure the size of the, of the recession. We do the horizontal incisions. And here you can see the, the scalpel, it goes just 
at the same angulation of the tooth because it's a split flap. We are not going to attach the periosteum at this level. Then at the at the recession part, we do a full flap, as we can see here, and we can see in the image, we raise that flap with the periosteum. And then again, with the scalpel, we start cutting and do the split flap here in the image. You can see how the periosteum is still attached to the bone. So that periosteum gives the bone um, the irrigation, the nutrition, to avoid losing that part of the bone. Because we know when we raise a flap, we can lose some part of the, of the bone because there's no irrigation from the, from the um, periosteum. But if we keep it there, we don't lose much. So we are gonna, first of all, this search is, you, you try to raise the whole flap with the um, scalpel. We don't want to use any other instrument. It has to be very delicate. And over here, we are giving a split flap again to give the, the mobility of the, um, of the flap. Again, with the root planning of the area which was exposed to the, to the oral cavity, and then we place the EDTA on the, on the root. We leave it for two minutes, we rinse it out, and we are already uh, prepared to close it. Here with the, with the arrows, we can see the difference um, on the root where the fibers were attached and then the, the part of the root that we prepared. So the, the, when the, where the fibers were attached, we don't touch it. It's a little bit uh, rough, but there's no calculus, there's no bacteria over there. So we are gonna, don't wanna have any trouble. Next part is the papilla. We have to de epitalize those papillas, the anatomical papilla that we keep in place. Now we have to go and de epitalize that. Once the papilla are de epitalized, we are ready to move the, the flap coronally and close it. And look at this when, where the needle goes to close it goes to the vertical incisions first. Usually, we used to go um, to the coronal part to put the flap in place and then go to the vertical incision, like any other surgery, surgery that we do. But here, we try to go first to the vertical incisions to avoid tension on the flap. So we have to do a, a flap closure without tension, without any tension. So if we put the, the first um, knots on the vertical, we avoid tension on the flap. And here we can close it. First the verticals, and then we put um, another knot on the coronal part to, to keep the flap in place and very uh, attached to the tooth has to be in intimate contact to the tooth to have, um, to avoid, to have a very a big clot and have better uh, blood supply. So it's gonna be there in place. So you can see here in the, um, in the drawing, the, in the sketch, the intimate contact of your flap to the tooth. That's gonna give us the result. So this was a very easy case. We, we have here a lot of uh, keratinized tissue. The papillas were in place. We didn't lose any, any papillas. It was a class one, uh, Miller class one. So those cases are very predictable. We don't want to see here any composites on the root to avoid the sensitivity. This is much better treatment and we need to uh, convince the patient, to educate the patient to brush differently to avoid these kind of problems. Because these uh, non-surgical lesions weren't because of um, occlusal trauma, they were because of brushing. Usually, this kind of, um, of recession 
are made because of the brushing technique or because of ortho. Sometimes when they do ortho, they go with the, um, they, they want to make the, the arch a little bit wider and they move the, the tooth towards to the bone. So they, they lose that um, buckle bone and make a recession on time. It's, it doesn't happen at the beginning, but it's going to happen on time. Uh, Luis, let me ask you a question. If you can go back one photo. So in this yeah. case, the first case that you shared with us, how long was it? I mean, I can see the photo on the left. That's how you started. And the photo yeah. on the right, after the surgery, how many weeks or days or whatever was this photo taken? Three months. Three months. And, and then uh, uh, how stable in time do you see this procedure being? I mean, if you, if you have a small lesion like the one that you're showing right now, uh, how long, I mean, if you follow it up a year, two years, three years, what does the evidence say? What is your experience? How stable are, is this result? Well, we, we have to see that because in this particular case, we have a lot of keratinized tissue to start with. So if we have a very nice keratinized tissue, we can do this procedure, which is a coronal band flap, and it's very predictable on time. But if we do a soft tissue graft underneath, connective tissue graft underneath this flap, it's much uh, stable on time than the advanced flap only. So we have to, to diagnose first, this is the, the coronal advanced flap is the, the easiest uh, flap that we can do. So I, I wanted to start with this. Then we are gonna see more complicated cases with a very thin biotite uh, of soft tissue. And now we have to do something else because we don't have enough tissue to maintain it on time. So if you're asking me this kind of uh, surgery, it's very stable on time if you remove the main cause of the recession. So if you educate your patient to rush in a different way, you can keep uh, that result on place for many, many years. But okay, thank you. If, you, if you put a connective tissue underneath your graft in, in intimate contact with the tooth, you're gonna gain more keratinized tissue. So you're gonna have more protective tissue to the tooth. So you're gonna avoid the recession much better on time. All right, thank you. This is another case, uh, different technique, because when you see over here, the, the final result at the beginning is not very nice. You see the, the surgical papillas are wider than the anatomical papilla. So there's a lot of tissue. There's more tissue on the tooth than in the neighbor tooth, but we want to, to have our flap at least one millimeter coronally to the CJ. This is another technique which is more conservative. There's no horizontal incision, just two verticals in a V shape. And then the technique is the same. We, we cut, uh, we do a split flap, then we do a full flap at the level of the recession. We raise our flap. Same technique, we raise the whole flap, a split uh, flap at the end to give mobility to, to, this, to this flap. Then the root planning, we place the EDTA and then we suture. Same suture and first at the vertical incisions. And this is the final result. The final result on this kind of uh, technique is much better but it's way more complicated to do it because of the irrigation. Sometimes we, we get a, a necrosis on the flap because it's very, very thin at the level of the, of the papilla, of the surgical papilla. So we don't wanna see this. And if we have some necrosis, it's gonna uh, heal for a second intention and we're gonna have some scars. But this is the intimate contact of the flap to the tooth. 
how we can do it here on the kinase because it's easier we have wider papillas in mesial and distal so our result is more predictable and this is the final result very very nice there's no scars and as you can see here because of the vertical incisions goes only one millimeter beyond the the mukachinchival um, junction there's no scars we, we don't see scars on the um, uh, keratinized tissue so this is the the beginning and the final result now we're going to go uh, to another technique which is the bilaminal layer where we have to add some connective tissue that we are gonna uh, take from either the palatal or tuberosity to the tooth. So th the technique is kind of the same. The only difference is we have to place the connective tissue and we have to suture it with a severable suture because we are gonna leave it over there. We are not gonna take it out. And then we put the flap on top. And as you can see here, the the flap, the, the, the graft, it's one millimeter uh, apical to the CJ. We don't want to place it uh, coronally, just the flap goes coronally to the CJ. So it's very stable on time, one year, two years, is stable on time. Uh, well, this is kind of the same technique. I want to go to another kind of, well, this is uh, something different because what we have here, it's sometimes when we see a recession, it, it has uh, a loss of dental volume at the root surface. It has a, like, a, um, Looks like with a spoon, you've removed some part of the, of the tissue at the root surface. That's because of the root is, is weaker than the, the enamel. And when you brush very hard, you are just um, causing erosion of the, of the root surface. And you don't used to see cavities on this part, but it's a very, um, it's like a glass, it's the, the root surface. It's very plain. So when we place our graft over there, we don't do anything else to the root. We just um, polish the, the angles and we put our connective tissue graft on top of that dot on the root and we place our flap on top of that. There's very stable on time and you don't have to do anything to the root surface. You don't have to place any uh, composite or uh, glass ionomer, anything. Just put your graft over there and close it up. It's very, very stable on time. Luis, let me ask you a good question. So in these cases that you're showing, the one that you're showing right now and the one previously, where are you getting your soft tissue for the graft? Are you going to the palate? Is it? Usually I go to the pilot and I'm gonna show you in a few slides how to uh, harvest that uh, soft tissue. All right, thank you. Let, let me see. Here is with the images. Let, let's go there. Well, first of all, I wanna show you this case. This is an interesting case, uh, Sabrina. She came to me with this lesion. The, the soft tissue around the root was very, very um, inflammated. There, you can see different color on the root. There's a cavity underneath that, uh, that root. And that's because of this. They put a, like a flipper prosthesis because she lost the tooth and she doesn't, um, she doesn't want to have an implant. She, when she came to me, she said, I want to fix this because it's hurting my gums and I don't want to have an implant. She was very afraid to implants. So we say, okay, let's see what we can do. First thing that we do, take out the flipper just to do 
uh, bone um, temporary to the to the tooth and leave the tissues heal. After the tissue heal, we prepare the um, how we want the surgery. And you see if if you see here on the um, on the temporary side, there's a depression on the on the soft tissue. That's because of the lack of bone underneath and lack of tissue. So on the same surgery we can do both uh, both sides the recession side and the um, temporary because we want to have a better aesthetic result. What we did here, we place uh, the, the, the allograft, the um, soft tissue graft on the recession of the canin and the, we, we tunnel to the, to the premolar and we, pl we place over there a uh, soft tissue graft as well. And then we close everything. This is the result at the beginning and at the end. And we gain the, the soft tissue. We, we finish the recession. Uh, there were some cavity on the canine. What we did just to root plan and scale uh, that root and nothing else with the, um, we place the soft tissue graft on that area and we close the flap. After that, because she didn't want to have any implant, we did what we call, um, it's like a Maryland bridge, but it's a... Uh, this is a California name. bridge, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's a, an anchor bridge. Because it, the it's all Lithium disilicate, we bond to the tooth, and on top of that, we place, we put a veneer on the, that area. With the veneer, we avoid to have any um, black triangles, because with the Maryland bridge, we used to have black triangles uh, on the um, on the neighbor tooth. On here, we can avoid this, and just finish the case with no recession, with the anchor bridge, no implant, very easy for the patient, very easy for us. We just have to prep a little bit the tooth, the canine has a root canal, so I, I went a little bit deeper and we finished this case. It's another way to do it, it's very easy. We have here uh, tissue to cover the, the recession. This is another case. Um, single uh, recession on the 30, 31, I would say, but I, I forgot how to name it in English. Anyway, we go to the palate, we take a, a connective tissue graft, and then we that do the That is surgery. 23, if I'm not mistaken. 23? Could be, I, I forgot about that, Mario. Then we place our connective tissue to the um, to the tooth, very attached to the tooth, and we cover with the with the graft. This is the result. I, I think it's four, three, four months after surgery. These kind of cases are a little bit more complicated because our class three of Miller, and we have we lost some um, papilla on the on the neighbor tooth. You can see between number. Uh, 23 and 24 there's a lack of papilla and there were a lack of papilla at the beginning too and then uh, between 22 and 23 there's a little bit lack of papilla so there it's not as predictable as the other uh, class one of Miller but we can still do it. Now Luis let me ask you let me go back to the photo let me ask you a question here because uh, I've had cases like this I don't I don't do this type of surgery but I've, I've had cases like this and I've referred them to a periodontist and I have had patients like this that have had a surgery like the one that you're showing, but in two steps. So first, they go ahead and they do a, uh, a gingival graft to achieve more keratinized tissue, right? Mm -hmm. And then they go back, you know, I don't know, th two weeks, two months or three months later, and then they do the repositioning of the flap. Is that just a different yeah. approach? Uh, does it is, is one better than the other? Is, is it one more stable than the other? You, do you have any experience with that? 
Yes. Um, first of all, you have to, to diagnose your case. If you don't have any uh, vestibule, when you move your flap, uh, your, the lip, there's no vestibule at all. And the, the recession is at the level of the, of the vestibule, at the level of the CJ. It's better, first of all, to do a pre gingival graft to gain either um, connective tissue at the, at the level of the recession and to gain vestibule. And after that, you go ahead and you advance coronally your flap and, and cover the recession completely. In this case, we had a very nice vestibule, so we can do it. And there's no a big frenum. If you have a very big frenum and you want to remove it, you can do it with a fringival graft and you cover everything. You cover the, the two central incisors and the two laterals to get a very nice vestibule and to avoid to have that ephraim, which sometimes helps to, um, to get the recession deeper. So we have to diagnose, not every case is the same. We cannot do the same uh, technique in every single case, but with a very nice diagnosis, you can go ahead and do both uh, sides, different tooth, because not every recession is the same. Sometimes we have a very uh, shallow recession in one tooth and, and the next tooth is a very deep recession. So you can't address the tooth recession in the same way, but we can do it in the same surgery, but different, it's like in the same surgery, we have to do two different techniques. Okay, I, I got you, thank you. For example, here, multiple recessions. It's not the same to do multiple recession as a single recession. This is a way more complicated because we have to advance a very big flap to address all this recession. And the recessions in maybe in one tooth is one millimeter and the next tooth is three millimeters. So something like this, two sides. This is a very, thin biodog of the patient. So because of the brushing, it's a young patient, he brushed very hard. So he got recession in both sides of his mouth. And the technique is kind of the same, but we are gonna try to avoid vertical incisions in here. And because we avoid the vertical incision, we do like the split uh, flap to create the surgical papilla in angle. So we have to select, first of all, the main recession. Usually is the, the tooth in, in the center. Uh, in this case, it's the canine. So you can see how the, the first incisions goes um, towards to the, the neighbor tooth. And after that, in the, in the premolars and molars, the, 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 um, the incision, the, the obliqual incision goes the same way and to the lateral and the, the central goes to the other way. So the only tooth that has two split incisions, two oblique incisions are different are the canine. The other tooth, always the same, the same way. And over here, we are gonna place in this uh, premolar, the connective tissue graft. On the other tooth, it's gonna be just an advanced flap as we used to see before. So this is the technique. We, we go um, with the scalpel very parallel to the tooth to do the, the split technique. And we're gonna start um, elevating the papilla as we used to see before. Here we can see the, um, the connected tissue graft, which was harvested from the palate like a free gingival graft. And after that, we cut the epithelium of the, of the graft to place it in the, um, in the tooth. This, uh, in a few slides, I'm gonna cover different ways to harvest from the palate the, the graft. But this is a very nice technique because you can harvest a very thin uh, graft from the palate and then you can cut only the epithelium. So what we are gonna have is the 
better part of the connective tissue, which is um, very, um, the, the fibers are very uh, thick at the very coronal part of the, of the graft. So we don't wanna have any uh, glands or um, adipose tissue. So it's very nice tissue. And you can see, because it's very small, it looks like a white tissue. We defertilize the papillas, we place our graft on place, and then we suture with a sling suture. Here we have to, to do a sling suture in everything in the tooth. You can see there's two sutures for papilla. So one mitial, one distal. So the, the whole flap is well attached. There's no vertical incisions. So we have to close it up with no tension. And to do this, we have to release this flap with a split flap at the very end to avoid any uh, tension and have very good mobility of the flap. This is uh, one side, the left side is done, and then we do the same technique on the right side. We place a soft tissue graft on the, the, the connective tissue graft of the premolar, and then we close it up. And this is the final result, the, the pre and the, and the post up in the, in the second picture. Uh, Louise. Yes, Kevin. Um, just to clarify, so with this case, you're going split thickness um, to the mucogingival junction and then going full thickness and then doing periosteal releases to get the mobility? Um, yes, but the periosteal releases is a split flap as well. Right. You don't go a uh, full thickness flap there. The only full thickness flap that you are going to do is at the level of the of the, of the recession. Gotcha, thank you. After that, it's only a split flap because of the, the papillas and then the, the releasing flap. Okay, thank you. So this is another case. And what you can see here in the first picture, it's a very thin biotide. And when you see something like this, you can see the the arteriolas and and you can see through the the tissue through the gum the part of the root surface so you're gonna have the hissences and because of the this thin tissue and when you open up here you have only one uh, recession in number uh, 23 we said so when we open up we see the hissences and recession and all the other tooth so what we want to address in here is to have um, predictability on time to maintain this tissue and to avoid recession in the future. And we do this usually before ortho because if they have to move these teeth and you have a very thin biotype, you're going to create recession on time. You, you like it or not, you're going to create it because of the movement of the tooth. It's a, a little bit of trauma and because if you don't have any connective tissue underneath that uh, very thin biotite, there's just the, the epithelium part attached to the tooth. When you try to move it a little bit, you get the recession. So you have to change that biotite and you're gonna want to place a very nice uh, connective tissue graft underneath those uh, recessions and to cover everything up. So you can see here, it's a very wide um, gingival graft, and you suture it up to change the, the, the bioid of the patient. You, you didn't just address one recession, you just changed the whole uh, gingival biotype because it was very, very thin. Now with this thick uh, gingival biotype, you can maintain it on time, you can avoid a recession, you can do ortho if you want to do ortho and, and be sure that your tissue is going to be stable on time. And now this is what to do when you have 
uh, more gum that you want to, to have is, is in the gummy, sli uh, gummy smiles. And usually it has with a um, uh, passive eruption. After passive eruption, you have more uh, tissue and you have to remove it. So there's different type of, of patients with the passive eruption. Sometimes when you have a lot of uh, tissue covering your tooth, there's the, the mucochinchial la, uh, junction is apical to the, um, to the CJ. Sometimes it's at the level of the CJ. And sometimes you have a very thick um, biotype and you have a lot of keratinized tissue. And sometimes the keratinized tissue is very uh, small. And when we, you want to open it up, there's no, like the, the second picture here, there's just a, a little bit of keratinized tissue after, after that, there's a lot of uh, mucosa. If you cut that, you, you lose uh, the whole keratinized tissue, you're gonna have recessions, you're gonna have inflammation, and there's no protective tissue to those tooth. So you have to approach it differently. So first of all, we have to measure the tooth to see the, the proportion of the tooth to see where to take an x-ray to see where the bone is because it's not the same this picture the the first picture where the bone is one or two millimeters uh, apical to the cj and the second picture the bone is at the level of the cj this different completely different approaches so we have to be sure what kind of uh, surgery we want to do and first of all, if we have, um, we measure everything, we, over here we have to do the, the probing depth and the, uh, the bone, the, to, to probe the bone, to see where the bone is, if it's the, the bone at the level of the CJ or not. And we have to see if we have a keratinized CJ. So in this picture, we have a lot of keratinized tissue. We don't know where the bone is, but because of we have keratinized tissue, we just do a gingivectomy. We cut the gingiva um, at the level of at the tooth and the CJ. We measure where this, the CJ is and we cut the gingiva. We take it out, we raise a flap, and we can see here where the CJ is and where the bone is. So we are gonna take a little bit bone, we are gonna do a osteoplasty and osteotomy. To, the osteotomy is to um, remove the bone at the level of the CJ. We are gonna go two or three millimeters apical to the CJ. And the osteoplasty is to create the, the grooves um, between the tooth, so to have a better uh, aesthetic result at the end. Here you, you have uh, one case. The, the tooth were uh, square and there were a lot of uh, gingiva on, on her smile. This is the whole smile. This is a type one. And this is when we remove the, the gingiva and we create a new margins for those tooth. Because we have a lot of uh, keratinized tissue and it was a thick biotype we were sure that this is gonna go well, we are not gonna have any recessions and we are not gonna have any uh, tissue growing to the, to the tooth because we put plane at the level of the CJ. Pre-post, and this is how the tooth were at the beginning and this is at the end. So we we'll go from here to here. This is an act case and here we're going to go step by step first of all you can see where the gingival margin is it's very up there's a lot of keratinized tissue and we measure first of all with the with the probe we, we do the probing and we put just um blood spots marking the where the the cj is in both sides First of all, what I like to do is 
I, I try to do one like this, the right side first, and then compare with the, with the left side. And you can see the incisions goes from mesial to distal all the way. We don't worry about the, the, the papilla here. We go all the way, we cut, and here in the first picture, you see the, the gingivectomy is not as neat as you want to be, but it doesn't matter at the beginning because you have to give those tissues the time to heal and the bone is going to uh, give you where the soft tissue is going to be. And because the, the gingival biotype was very thick, you can see here how much bone this patient has. There's a lot of bulky bone. You have to start removing the, that bone, do the osteoplasty, and, and go like at least three millimeters to the tooth because of the of the gingival biotype. If, if it's um, not as thick biotype, you can go just two millimeters. You can probe here, you can see three millimeters from the CJ to the bone. And you're, you, you can see that you're go good with this. And now we are gonna go a little bit of um, implants, the grafting in implants. And this is a picture of Dr. Garam Morena. You can see here a very nice implant place long time ago. Usually before you, we used to place a wider implant. Uh, there's no inflammation at all around the implant. The, the crown were very nice aesthetically. And over on time, the, the soft tissue start losing. We lost a lot of soft tissue and now we have an issue. The, the, the static result of this uh, implant wasn't as good as it was at the beginning when the implant was placed. So another thing, there's no change, um, peritoneized tissue at the level of the implant. There's no distal papilla. So we have to start thinking what to do in this kind of cases, uh, you can see here the x-rays. There's no uh, mucositis, there's no uh, perimplantitis. It's just um, aesthetic, but aesthetic outcome that we have here. It's a very wide implant. You can see there's no buccal bone on the implant because before we used to place wider implants on the central incisors to have a better uh, emerging profile. But on time, we're starting to see these kind of things. So uh, there's different kind of approaches when we want to address this. One option is to remove the implant. Um, and after removing the implant, do nothing. Just let the soft tissue heal to gain some soft tissue after that, uh, GBR, uh, graft some bone, graft some soft tissue, try to wait and then do another implant uh, and try to solve the case. There's a lot of surgery involved, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of money involved. And sometimes we can try to do something different. We can uh, start thinking differently because of the of the implant was placed in a very nice position, even though it's very wide, the, the position was good. So we tried to keep that implant in place. We did some uh, ortho first to change the angulation of the lateral and to um, extrude a little bit the, this lateral, you can see it here in the x-ray, and we changed the crown of the tooth. We placed a zirconia crown uh, zirconia abutment and zirconia crown because the zirconia has better stability of the soft tissue. Uh, the soft tissue heals better around zirconia than it does around metal. That's why we they, they try to do uh, zirconia crowns in this kind of cases and the aesthetic result was amazing. From this kind of situation uh, 
we were thinking at the beginning to remove the implant. We, we um, decided to keep it. And then the, the soft tissue graft with ortho and time, let it heal and you can achieve a very nice result. So the, the important part here is to diagnose with the implant and with perio to see how much bone do you have, how much connect, uh, uh, keratinized tissue, where the mucochinchival junction is, um, not just if you have bone or not, to place wider implants to have a better uh, emerging profile. And over here, I don't wanna go very deep in, in here, but because an implant, we don't have um, the ligament, we don't have blood supply coming from the ligament, and we have bacteria at the interface on the implant and the crown, we have a worse situation than uh, with tooth. The, the difference is very clear that the gingiva has to attach to the implant surface. Either it's in the implant surface or the abutment, but has to be attached to that. And the bone has to be very wide because there's no irrigation from the ligament. So you can, you can have very thin bone on the implant, which you can have in tooth because you have irrigation from the uh, mucosa, from the gum from one side and from the ligament from the other. But with implants, it doesn't happen. The, the irrigation comes from the bone itself or from the gingiva. If you remove the ligament, you're gonna lose a lot of bone. So we have to have a, it's better to have narrow implants to avoid um, this, this kind of situation to keep more uh, thick bone on the buccal part to avoid losing it. Uh, and the, the thing that, that caused this remodulation, uh, bone remodulation around the implants are the, the plaque accumulation on the surface the, the bacteria accumulation because of the of the gap in the implant and the and the abutment, the micro movements of those pieces, which now the the best uh, the best connection is the conical connection uh, to have the platform switching to avoid to have that connection close to the bone. We can um, change the, the the connection to to have the um, bio the biologic width more to the center of the implant instead of uh, just at the level of the of the bone. So, if you're going to have uh, filtration of bacteria, you're going to have uh, bleeding, uh, bad smell, pet implantitis on time. So you want to try to address those factors when you do implants. And the, the importance of the keratinized tissue, because it, it's gonna prevent the recessions. And if you have a, a really thick uh, keratinized tissue and, and uh, connective tissue underneath the, that epithelium around the implant, uh, it's gonna protect the, the implant itself. It's gonna attach to the to the implant surface because of the of the thickness of the um, of the fibers, so it's going to help you to avoid recessions uh, to keep the implants uh, clean because the, the attachment to the tooth is going to give um, better aesthetics and at the surgery is going to be much better because you are, you are going to have connective tissue. Um, I mean, keratinized tissue instead of just mucosa. If you have only mucosa around the implants, you're gonna have mucositis or pain implantitis, and the patient is gonna have a pain sometimes if they have a very bad prosthesis on, on top of that. And something like this usually happens. You know, you can see the, the black margins, which at the beginning you didn't see it, you can uh, place here in the, in, the first, in the center picture, a little bit of um, pink porcelain, try to cover 
that up and maybe it's go is nothing is going to happen and and the patient is going to take it sometimes this the implant can can be seen through the through the gum and we have to do something when we have cases like this and uh, Dr. Sukeli and Dr. Chu and Tarno made a very nice uh, classification. Uh, and they, what they tried to address were the, the um, problems of those kind of implants. When you don't have any uh, mucositis or perimplantitis around the implants, but you have a, static, uh, a really bad static outcome, uh, usually in the central incisors and laterals, where the bone is more difficult to keep in place. So uh, our possibilities were, first of all, to try to um, give back the, the anatomy of, of the perimplant zone, like the, the soft tissues, and we can do that with a GBR or just a um, soft tissue graft we can also change the position of the implant with a uh, destruction of the implant. We can do the explantation, we can remove the implant and then place a new one. Sometimes we have to do that if the implant was placed in a really bad position, uh, very uh, buckly, we can do anything like uh, on those situations. So we have to remove the implant. If the implant is in, in a good place, we can keep it, otherwise, Sometimes we have to remove it. And then the, th the last op option is just to um, block the implant, keep it, uh, put just gum on top of it and don't use it. Leave it there in place. So in other words, submerge the implant, just let the tissue grow around. Submerge, yeah, submerge the implant, don't use it, leave it. And, um, and when we have, this kind of situations, there's no, there's just goes around the implants buckly. We have to do something. If we don't do anything, over here we place a connective tissue graft in one and a free gingival graft on the other one. Uh, we have to do something. We have to gain keratinized tissue because the keratinized tissue is the, the tissue that is going to protect either the tooth and the implant we can't have only mucosa. Usually we have only mucosa because the keratinized tissue is attached to the tooth. If we lose the tooth, we lose the keratinized tissue and we place the implants, we suture everything up and we lose it. So we have to, um, to take it from somewhere and to put it back where it has to be. So I'm gonna go a little bit I don't want to talk about this, but this is some cases you, you see with the recession, we put a chinchiba graft on top, uh, cover it up. You see, these kind of cases are very difficult to treat. Why? Because the, um, the dentist who referred this patient said, I just cemented the crown. I had this problem. I don't want to redo the crown. We can not uh, take the crown out. So I say, okay, but the, the possibilities are very limited. So just cover this uh, black uh, space with some tissue and that's it. The patient is happy with the, with the crown. I say, okay, I'll try to do it, but I cannot uh, manage where the soft tissue is gonna, is gonna be at the end because the, the, the gap of the gum of the crown and the abutment is still over there. We, we cannot change that or something like this, where the, the crown on the number seven, you can see here, there's a lack of tissue, but I, I like when I see this kind of abutment, when you don't have any uh, shoulder on the abutment, it's very straight. So if you have a straight abutment, you can, um, predict where the, the margin is gonna be. So very strict abutment. We did the surgery in this kind of 
uh, it's the same surgery as we used to do on implants, but we, we have to deepitalize the, the papilla more to the palatal area. And we are gonna cover everything up. So the, we gain some soft tissue there, it's more stable and we go, we can go with the final uh, prosthesis. Something like this, when the, looks like similar case than the other one, it's a number seven as well. It's the, the crown, it's bigger, goes more epically. There's, uh, you can see how um, black is that uh, tissue. You can see the, the implants through the, through the gun, but the, the implant was placed very backily. So there's nothing to do over there. We have to remove the implant and gain some soft tissue. We put, put a connective tissue graft underneath and then we wait and we place another implant seven months after that because there's nothing to do with that implant. It was very, very backly. Um, well, this is the, the course I'm gonna do here in Argentina with uh, my colleague Julio and this is so but let me see if I'm gonna go a little bit here because I thought we had the, this part okay this is uh, how to take the, um, the graph from the palatal and the most important thing here we have to see where the the artery the palatal artery is and um, the foramen is close to the distal to, to the second molar we cannot cut anything over there because if we cut the the artery close to the foramen it goes up and start bleeding and goes to the skull so we want to just take that um that repair like we don't want it to touch anything close to the to the artery and there's uh, two parts where we can get the the, the connective tissue one is the trovedosity the other one is the the palatal and the palatal we have two sides the, the posterior uh, side which is goes to the premolar uh, to the molar areas or more anterior to the premolars or canine but there's different kind of tissue where we can get. If we go more um, distal to the molar area, the connective tissue that we can get, it's better because the, the connective tissue layer is uh, thinner. There's a one millimeter. And in the anterior zone, it's a very wide connective tissue which comes with glands and a lot of um, adipose bone, adipose glandular layer. You can see here, the molar area is, is more neat, the premolar area has with, uh, came with um, glandular tissue. So this is what we usually do. We take the, um, from the molar area, we sometimes we deepitalize the, um, the free gingival graft uh, outside of the mouth and we use that. We take the whole graft and we deepitalize um, outside of the mouth to have a very neat connective tissue graft. Other technique is to do only one um, incision and to take the graft from underneath, leaving the, the periosteum in place so the patient is not going to have any pain uh, if we leave the periosteum over there. The, the only problem the, the patient has pain or some necrosis is when you have the, the periosteum, when you take the periosteum with you. 